right. Okay, let's get started here. I'll, I'll just keep letting people in as I can here. All right, so as you see today, uh, we got a few things uh, to cover. We'll start, um, I guess we'll start here. I don't know really where to start today, but I guess I'll start here. Um, I'm not going to lie to you guys, it's been a hard week. It's been a little bit of a difficult week because this has obviously been out in the world enough now over the last three labs uh, that I've had a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot, but a number of people come to me and just say, you're crazy, dude. We don't need to be doing this. This is live sound. Who cares? My show sounds great. I don't need to do this. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Some of it very negative, saying, you know, you shouldn't be teaching people this. They don't need to do this. They don't need to deal with it. All, I mean, a wide range of stuff here. Uh, so, you know, I've been kind of trying to process that a little bit. I, I, I will, in fairness, say to that, the response to it positively has been overwhelmingly favorable. But just the, the amount of people out there that were willing to come forward and just completely denounce it was kind of breathtaking, honestly. And, you know, I kind of wanted to put it down to, uh, you know, it's just the way, the way the world is right now, et cetera. You know, with, you know, the minute something comes up that's even remotely new, the first thing people do is try to denounce it things like that. that. That is an actuality of our world, but I'm just here to tell you that's not the new world. Uh, I have been down this path before. I, I, I'm a little battle-hardened uh, when it comes to this because the exact same thing happened to me with virtual sound check. You know, the first times I presented that to people, their response was, oh, we don't need to do this. Come on, who is actually going to do this? You know, nobody's going to work that way, blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, it just went on and on. Uh, and a similar thing happened uh, when I started doing LCR PA systems, you know, on my tours. Similar sort of thing. Why the hell is he doing that? Stereo's fine. We don't need to be doing it, you know. I mean, it was just all over the shop uh, in terms of negativity about it. I mean, people coming after me about it. Uh, but, you know, in, in this particular instance, for sure, it, it was kind of breathtaking that it was happening because, this, I, I mean, I feel very, very confident here the science is on my side here. Uh, and those arguments are not going to age well over time, right? So, uh, so you know, we're going to, you know, if you're out there in the world, you know, let's talk about it. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, already, a lot of disinformation about what I said and what I haven't said. So one of the first things we're going to do today is I'm going to give you some talking points. You guys are going to become my allies if you want to become my allies here. Uh, so let's go through a couple of bullet points here. Uh, so I'm going to give you the top five things Robert did not say during labs one, two, and three. Okay, everybody okay with this? All right, so here we go. Number one, <clears throat> the need for manual delay compensation when using external processing only applies to SXL and Avid Live Sound products. I did not say that in any way, shape, or form. And as you're going to see here, it actually applies to all digital consoles, all of them. Right? not just SXL, I just happen to be showing it here, uh, and we have a really good example of when it needs to be done, or you know, if you want to do it when it needs to be done. So uh, what I actually said was, if you're using externally sourced processors as input inserts that are sourced from outside of the console's accounted for architecture, right, outside of its throughput, i.e. plug-in servers, DSP cards, analog inserts, then you are subject to this impulse offset that is going on here, all right? No live sound console on the market accounts for these types of inserts. If anybody knows differently, definitively knows a console in the market, a live sound console in the market, that can automatically delay compensate for processing inserts at input stage outside of the realm of their internal processing, speak up, let me know. I'm all ears, okay? Yeah, let's see more people in here, whoops. All right, we'll get through these pretty quickly here. Well, uh, number two, monitor engineers should never use insert plugins that add latency to a path. Sorry, I did not say that. I did not say it. What I actually said was, as in all things live audio, it's situational. And what I'm trying to arm you with here is knowledge and insight to help you get through these challenges, all right? So if I, and I give an example, if I'm mixing monitors and I ended up with a lot of path link difference for in my drum inputs, for example, 
then yeah, the results of the processing, I, I, I would then compensate those channels. I would get them back into alignment. Those drum channels, I would try to glue together my drum mix again and get it back back together before I start sending it places. So, But I would not compensate all of the channels back to a longest path in a monitor path. It's probably going to drive the singers absolutely crazy because they're already challenged with latency, even as short as it is on a regular throughput. So uh, I did not say that. So please get it right and understand the situation. Uh, monitor engineers should never use S6L because it requires manual delay compensation. I know, I know. See answers one and two. That should give you your answer there. I didn't say it. You should never operate a digital console without manually delay compensating it. I didn't say that either. Uh, so paraphrasing here, look, as I said to you a couple of times in the labs, the show is going to go on. The show has been going on for years without people addressing this. But once you get your head around what's happening here, it will improve your audio. There may be great shows going on out there right now where nobody is paying any attention to this. And what I can say to that without question, 100% certain of this, is that if they have a lot of inserting going on, outside of the console, the processing outside of the console, that show would sound better if they would manually delay compensate. I'm, I feel very, very confident saying that. Do you have to do it? No, you don't. And I, for, for the record, I mixed for many years without doing this. There was just a tipping point where I got to, where I started adding some more modern processing to my situation. And all of a sudden I started realizing I was having to put polarity switches in odd positions or sometimes a polarity switch was not really having the impact that I thought it should have. And then the light bulb started coming on. I was like, okay, these are time offsets that's happening somewhere here. So it's all knowledge. You want to do it, do it. You don't want to do it, do it, do it. You want to ignore it. That's okay. I can't, I can't answer that part of it. All I can do is give you the information. You make the decision the best way you want to. Okay. And Right, this is an interesting one, and this one goes back a little ways. I've actually had this one come up a few times from people uh, who you know, are equating, and I, I actually don't know whether this is scientifically accurate or not, but equating latency and propagation. I, I, I definitely see those and use those two words very, very differently. But the idea is uh, that everything I'm saying is kind of irrelevant and untrue because uh, what we're doing is no different than just moving a microphone a few inches or moving a microphone a foot away. And it's just, it's just comparing apples to apples. It's not. Right? If, if we're talking about a latency, we're talking about an electronic movement that isn't taking the entire sound and moving it in time. If we're talking about, let, let's use the, the typical example here, a snare drum. Well, if I put a plug in on my snare drum that moves it a millisecond away, I've taken the entire sound now and moved it a millisecond later than the other things I'm trying to add up with it. If I take a microphone and move it a foot away from the snare drum, that's not the same thing at all, right? I've now changed the ratio of snare sound to surrounding sounds in that microphone. Matter of fact, I would challenge any of you, next time you're miking up a drum kit, go take and move the snare mic a foot out from the snare drum and show me that you can get the same big beefy snare drum that you like. I challenge you to do that, okay? So it's not the same. It's not the same. Who, who mics a snare from a foot away? Well, well, apparently people are saying that's the same thing as just going in and out of the console, you know, and creating a millisecond of delay. It's like, well, that's that's not the same thing at all here, at all. It's easy to kind of fall into that trap, in my opinion, but that is not the same thing at all. So that's kind of been my week, answering all kinds of inquiries about this and trying to hopefully uh, clear the air a little bit with it, uh, so. I think the clarification there, Robert, that you made very clear is everything leaving the console together at the yeah. same time. Yeah, That's really the point. It really is the point. And uh, you know, I, like I said, if, if there are guys out there that wanna shine that off and go, well, my show sounds fine, I don't need to do this. Brother, peace, go mix your show, all right? But don't tell me this is not having an impact if you are inserting external plugin processing on your channels. Just, it's just fact, factually inaccurate. Maybe just a, a matter of degrees of effect on it. I mean, we went through that for years with the, you know, the first venue console where, you know, we were inserting, uh, you know, 
third-party plug-in processing, but the difference, as I mentioned in the very first lab, and we'll go through this a little bit today, was that the mixing architecture and that processing architecture was happening on the same DSP chip. So the latency of inserting that processing on there was really small. I mean, one, two, three samples for the vast majority of processors. So you could get away with it because the relative offset of all the channels you inserted on was pretty small. You, you may not notice it, right? So, yeah, in that situation, if you want to you do it, whatever. But if you're talking about shifting inputs through inserting processing on channels that's going to move at a millisecond, two milliseconds, man, that, that is an eternity in live sound. So, I, I'm just trying, again, I'm just trying to arm you with knowledge. Take it and use it as you want. I just want to uh, alert you to it here. And Dave Rob. Okay, so uh, kind of on that note, let's see, what have I got coming up here? So uh, I want to kind of re kind of go over this because, um, and I made this slide after I watched a video last week. Like even, you know, <laughs> apparently even the competitors for S6L are watching these labs because they're already putting out their own videos now to, you know, use it, <laughs> take what I'm telling you and use it as leverage apparently, you know, so. Um, uh, a guy named, I, I hope I pronounced his name right because it's spelled a little odd in terms of this pronunciation, but a guy named Jim Royce uh, did, a, a, honestly, a really good little video on uh, the new Midas console, the new Midas HD console, talking about their delay compensation, uh, how they were handling it. I would encourage you to go watch it because it's going to drive home what I'm going to show you right here. But it's good. And, you know, he, he talks about delay compensation in all the right terms here in terms of its need the way they do it, et cetera. And I'll just go on record as saying, I, I think Midas, honestly, has handled delay compensation probably better than any of the consoles to date. Uh, you know, as a couple consoles are catching up with it, but they give you the most options. And, uh, but I picked up on two things in the, the demonstration that I thought were very interesting. One was, he said, depending on what delay compensation options you choose, you can create a throughput that is anywhere from about two milliseconds to 12 milliseconds, right? Doesn't that number sound familiar to anybody there? Remember my fully that's what, that's compensated? That's what yours was last. Yeah, wasn't far off that, right? So, you know, time is time. It takes time regardless. Now, the thing, the thing that I want to bring up here that was being discussed here, and we're going to cover this on the whiteboard here, is we've kind of uh, co-opted this term plugins to mean all kinds of things, right? Where people are, you know, and fairly, I think, they call plugins plugins regardless of whether it's internal to the console or external to the console. They kind of equate these two things, and they're just, they're not the same thing, all right? And I'll give you an example of it here. And sorry, Jim, if you're listening, I'm not picking on you here. You just happen to be the convenient example I'm going to use. There are other examples of this. You did a great job on that video. Uh, but he was talking about using uh, Midas plugins and the need for using internal delay compensation to compensate for it. And he goes through a whole process of showing you why you need to do it. And he gave the example of using a Midas distressor, right? Which is their version of the distressor, and it showed the rack with all the Midas plugins and that you needed to have delay compensation in if you were going to use those. Otherwise, you're going to comb filter the paths, just like we talked about in the previous labs here. Now, the difference is that is a processor that is designed by Midas it is it within their bubble of DSP and mixing architecture, so they know it. it. It's a very finite thing. They understand it. They can account for it in the throughput, right? But that is not a third-party plugin. That is not a plugin that is entering the console, entering that HD bubble, as he called it in the video, uh, externally, right? Which makes it unaccountable for you. Can't account for the time when it's out there uh, when they do it that way. So. You know, that, that's kind of what separates S6L, I think, and the Avid platform from a lot of consoles is that when, when you see something that's labeled distressor or something along those lines in the, the plug-in sets for S6L, that one's actually made by Empirical Labs, not by Midas, right, or not by Avid. It's not our version of it. That is actually one of those manufacturers using one of their processors on our system. It's an open architecture right there, right? But the challenge comes in that we have to be able to manage it properly as an input insert, okay? So let's, let's kind of go through this on the whiteboard here just for a second. So I, I don't know if this is scientifically accurate. I'll, I'll 
faint of that initially here, but this is just kind of how I parse out the different kind of system architectures that are out in the world, all right? So firstly, you would have uh, a console that has all of its mix plus its DSP slash FPGA, whatever processing, all in one basket inside the console, right? Uh, that's all easily accounted for. The throughput is deterministic. We know what the throughput is going to be on it. We can keep things in phase there very easily, right? This is generally, generally reserved for lower cost consoles. They will do this because there's not much flexibility in it, right? <clears throat> the next uh, type would be where they have the mixed DSP and the processing DSP or FPGAs separated, but they are still living inside that bubble of, uh, uh, how do I want to say it, of uh, deterministic throughput inside the console. I mean, this is what you see in the Midas, right? This is what you would see probably in Yamaha, where they're using that list of Yamaha plugins that are going to be in place. What's that? LV, well, yeah, LV1 is a great example. That's exactly the same thing. But the, the general mindset there is that's all one manufacturer's plugins in there. Very controlled environment. Nobody's getting in or out of that, uh, you know, disrupting the, the delay compensation that's in place. I mean, you see this in Yamaha. Uh, I think you, you probably see a very similar thing in Allen and Heath, you know, where they're, that's a very controlled world there. But the difference is, and, and I know this is nuance, and maybe it's meaningful to you, maybe it's not. But if we were to compare this to analog, right, this is the equivalent of going out with an XL4, and if you look right into your racks, it's all Midas processing, right? That's exactly what that would be. If I had a Yamaha sitting in front of me, I would look right, it would be all Yamaha processing. If I had a Digico sitting in front of me, I look right, it's all Digico processing. With SXL, we don't have that, right? If I have SXL sitting here and I look right in my racks, it's all the different manufacturers processing there. It's McDSP, it's Empirical Labs, it's whoever it is on our list, right? But it's how we get it into the console that is the challenge. So in our situation, so here's the, the last piece of it where we would have mixing DSP. This is what you would see in the uh, E6L engines and a separate DSP card that runs off of a bus. It runs through a PCI uh, e-bus. So that is a DSP card that has to be accounted for. That is not within a controlled throughput bubble. These are gonna, if we're using it as an input insert, these are not, uh, not controlled. We have to manually manage these. And all of these consoles have this challenge if we have an external server, whether they have a Waves card or whatever it's gonna be, I, I don't know of any console that can account for latencies outside of the console in their own delay compensation. If, again, if anybody knows differently on this, raise your hand, uh, but I don't. I have not been able to find anything that describes this this way, right? Is that making sense to everybody? It's really important to understand the difference when somebody's talking plugins, you know, it's like, well, what kind of plugin here? Is it actually part of the built architecture or is it something you're adding external to the console, right? Okay, so that said, any questions, uh, given what we've talked about the last couple of weeks here, uh, anything that we need to recover for anybody uh, with, within reason here? Raise your hand if you, if you got a question. I, hopefully you guys aren't all on mute right now and have hurt me. All good? Okay. All right, so I, and uh, this is by no means an official list, but this is what I can find, okay? Brian Norwood, I'll be right with you, buddy. This is what I've been able to find uh, in terms of who does what, uh, in terms of automatic delay compensation, all right? Uh, for us, I, I think over the first three labs here, you've kind of figured out what we can do with Avid. Uh, Digico, I, I know of no ADC options on that console. I, again, if somebody knows differently, let me know. Uh, Midas, and I'm using the uh, the new HD console as the example here. I don't know that this is the case on the M32 or anything down in that in that range, but it's ADC for all buses and Midas plugins. Uh, manual compensation needed for third-party processing. Okay. Solid state logic, similar thing. No ADC options, but they they can guarantee equal throughput of inputs to any output. Uh, but again, if you go outside the console for processing with waves, et cetera, I don't think there's any anything that they have there that can manually align the console or, or uh, automatically align the console, excuse me. Uh, Soundcraft, uh, no ADC there, but they uh, offered ADC very similar to how Waves does it in the real-time rack server. 
They can, you can do delay groups there and at least get, you know, processing on a given set of inputs that are using their inserts in time. Uh, Yamaha, similar to the Midas there, all, uh, it's ABC for all buses and Yamaha plugins, manual compensation for third-party plugins. Uh, Allen and Heath, again, no, no ADC really and, no, and would require manual compensation for any external processing. Like I, and again, tell me if I'm wrong. If they have a Waves card, you can go out to a Waves server and back, but I don't think throughput is actually accounted for there by any stretch. Uh, and Behringer, I'm really, and I'm really only using their 32 channel console as the option here. There's no ABC options there. I, I don't even know what the access to that console is in terms of external processing, but I can find out. Brian Norwood, go, man. You got a comment there? Sorry, I lost my mic for a second. Uh, right. I was just hoping uh, you could explain briefly, just so to help me understand, your routing too smart to take the measurements that you're taking. Uh, yes, I sure can. Uh, matter of fact, we can go right back to it here. Somebody else asked me that question. Uh, give me one second here. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll pull it up. All right, so stand by. Okay. All right, so this is what I showed last week. Uh, and I'll just ask again to make sure, can you guys see my cursor there? Okay, good. All right, so this is the path. Uh, and this, is, it, this, this first path I'm gonna show you is how I just uh, am measuring and setting my long path as a reference, right? So pink noise is coming from the on-console on generator and coming directly into a channel. And then from that channel, it is going directly to a matrix. X is from matrix here, okay? And then that output is going to the reference channel. Right? And that's gonna stay on all the time. You're never gonna turn this off. And then after that, that same pink noise is coming into the channel that I believe is the longest path and in my situation, it was the snare drum, which has to go through parallel compression and through a group to get to the master left right, which also goes up to it to a matrix that is patched to the measure channel, right? So the measure is going to be noise coming in here, up into an aux, an aux master into two plugins, returning to two channels. Those two channels actually would be this longest channel is going to go to the group. The group is going to be assigned to the ma uh, master left right, which also has plugins on it, and then it's going to go up to the matrix. All right, so we're going to compare those two path links and get our computer in alignment for it. Does that make sense to you, Brian? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so then the important piece of this, and I, you know, I'm going to have a couple of guests come on it that have been trying this. We're going to kind of walk through what they did and maybe some of the issues that they came up with as well here in a second. Uh, but you know the the some of the confusion that I've heard about in the past is where people will do this, set this up, and do the delay locator, right, and get whatever amount of time. Well, once you do that, you don't want to change that time. You don't ever want to delay locate again after that process. You've you've essentially taken the computer, the smart program, and aligned it to this path. That's how you get a flat phase trace there. All that's telling you is my computer path is the same length as my long path now, right? But now we're going to go measure a whole bunch of other channels and get it to be exactly the same going through, right? So if we were to go to our next channel now or, you know, start doing our measurements, now all the remaining channels, all you got to do is turn on the noise in a channel that is going to take the same path all the way to the matrix, you know, or, or its path all the way to the matrix. And it should look very different on smart and you start adjusting time on it until you get a flat face trace, right? You good there, Brian? I'm going to assume silence means yes. 
and remind people that all these documents are available at the end of these things that you can yeah, get. Yeah, yeah. If you guys don't, uh, yeah, Sully brings up a good point. I've been posting these up in the uh, in the Google folder, so look for an email after the sessions, and uh, I always post a link to that folder, so all of the docs that are in there are available to you guys. Like uh, this whole PowerPoint that I did last week with all the different scenarios. Uh, is in PDF form up there, so you can just open it up and use it as a reference if you need to use it, okay? Sound good? Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you so much. Good. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Uh, so at this point in the old program today, I, I think I'm going to actually invite a couple of people in here. Um, I'm going to start with my friend. Let's go with... Uh, you know what? I'm going to do Tim Harding first. Tim, are you in the room there, my man? I am here. Nice, nice. So I've been working with Tim a little while now and uh, helping him through this process, and uh, he's really taken it to heart. Uh, he's got, a, as you can see, an S3L system there, uh, which you know has a, a few challenges of its own in that it doesn't have input delay on every channel, so we have to, you know, have to kind of find out some uh, nice ways to do this to get his show file in play. So uh, Tim's going to take us through his show file that we just recently worked on, and... Uh, show you what he's got going on, how he's kind of solved this problem in his world. So I'm going to let Tim share his screen here, and we'll just walk through it here. What do you say? There you go. Might add that uh, this started out as a way to get um, some double busting going on the drums back on the SC48 profile days and manage layers at the same time. Yeah, and just kind of progressed into this thing. <laughs> it's all, it's all so, your fault. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, stand. I stand uh, accused and guilty. Uh, so, tell us what show is this? Queensrÿche that's up here. This is the latest Queensrÿche show file. Yeah. This show file, um, kind of underneath it all, before the compensation, it's it's about a two year old file, I think. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, but it was all about, in the beginning, it was all about double busting the drums and, and getting layer control. So, uh, yeah, no and I'll, where I, I'll give you this piece of insight, guys. You know, I was lucky enough to go see Tim mix this show here in Phoenix. And I, I know he, he wasn't deploying all of this compensation that he's going to be doing here. And it sounded great, man. I mean, it sounded really good. But could it have sounded that 10% better? If he would have been had this in play, I almost, I, I, I'm not even going to say I almost, I guarantee it would. There were there were things that I was hearing during the night where I thought, hmm, I wonder if that's in phase. You know? There were there were mistakes that I made in the beginning, right? So, you know, the whole goal was about double busting the drums. So, like, some other things got ignored right from the get-go. Yeah. When we built this little S3 system to take out earlier this year on the ground tour, um, I didn't, I didn't go back and check things, which I should have. Yeah. And, uh, and come to find out that, you know, the longest path wasn't what I thought it was. It was something <laughs> else completely different. So, so here we are. This has all been rectified. It hasn't been played through a loud PA yet because we've all been sitting at home goofing off doing stuff. And uh, here's, the, here's the longest path. Uh, the longest path. And that was your vocal, yes. right? Your vocal turned, it out, turned out to be the longest path? Turned out to be my vocal because I have um, two things inserted on the vocal because I still have yet to buy into one or the other. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> what, just, for the, just for the record, what do you have inserted on it? Let's go to your plugin rack and see what you got. Or just click on your plugin there and take a see. There we go. Here they so are. You I got have the Pro the, Compressor and the Multiband. Pro Compressor and Multiband. Okay. All right, so obviously you see there, Tim's uh, already ran the delay locator on that path. And in his situation, I I'm just going to tell it here because I know it, Tim, if that's all right. Yes. Uh, if you go back to your inputs page there, I believe the challenge for you was, okay, well, how, how do I get my drums aligned to that vocal path now? Because I don't have channel delay on every channel. How do I do that? And I, I only have 40 plug-in slots, so it's not like I can just put a time adjuster on every channel here. In, in addition, I only have two plug-in slots per channel, so you know, I've got to be very judicious how I do this. So uh, explain your, your adjusted paths in the drums there, Tim, and then we'll probably, I'll probably bounce off from that because I don't want to eat up all the time here. I've got a couple so, pieces to show here. 
So, uh, so we go back to the original, the original thing of, of double busting the drums and all the drums pass through, uh, pass through two time adjusters to split it up, to get the, the drum group and then get the crush group. Right, but uh, you're not using actually a subgroup there, right? You're returning, you're going aux out to those time adjusters and returning to two stereo channels, right? That is correct. I'm, I'm utilizing the aux out so I can leverage as many groups as I can for other things. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I feel uh, so, so, that, so that's the path. You can see right here at the, at the top of the aux sends, there's my send for the drum. So the kick, snare, and toms all send out to that and return back into a channel stereo channel twice regular drum it's those white stereo. channels right that are just yeah. on the left side right yeah these two uh, right there all right um so that brings all that stuff in the time so you know the other thing we had to add was we had to add more time adjusters to the, all the brass to the hi-hat to yeah the stuff that was not going to go through your crush path there right exactly 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 so those are the places that you had to do the time adjuster then to, to get this to work right absolutely absolutely Okay, and I great. had to add, I had to add time adjusters also to the bass channels and the guitar channels. Yeah, yeah. And I did that at the group level because um, it, it, it's forty, it's forty holes, you know, in the practice. right. Yeah, you, yeah, you're going to have some compromises there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just uh, yeah. just for the sake of argument, Tim, uh, mute your vocal there, and let's turn on. I don't know, turn on the bass drum. Let's see if it's lining yeah. up there. There's kick drum. Right. So there you go. So now, uh, as we've been kind of saying, now kick drum and vocal are leaving the vo the console at the same time now, right? Which is the ultimate right. goal. Right. Okay. Nice work. And as you, as you can see, that path is, you know, one and a half milliseconds. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. It's nice. Okay. Tim, thank you very much for bringing that Thanks in. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you putting that all together for us. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Who else have I got up here? Let's see. I got... Uh, uh, I got Jason Alt in the room. Jason, did you get your rig together there? Yeah. Nice. Yes, I did. Share it up, man. Let's see it. <clears throat> and and Jason so, is on. Di which Digico are you on here? So I'm on SD12. SD12. Um, and I'm using Wave Super Rack um, for all sorts of stuff. Um, and I had this rig out on tour because I discussed this with you actually pretty early on yeah. where I had all these low end issues because I have four kick drum inputs on one kick drum, two trigger, two mic. And I think I see your problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it wasn't my choice. It's, you know, I, I work for, currently was working for an artist that very gets to dictate exactly what he wants yeah, yeah. every specific moment. Um, so um, between that and the base, I had all these challenges low end wise and came up with a couple of creative solutions. Um, and then after the first lab that you did, I was like, I'm going to start from scratch and see what this does. And literally, um, other than a few things, I will tell you, it cleaned up every issue that I was having in the low end all the way around. Wow. Um, <laughs> That's saying something, and, brother. And I, you know, like I've used the same pair of Genelec as reference forever. So, um, and so I know exactly what it all sounds like, but I will say this, it, you know, for, from going from a console that started, that had delay compensation and then using the waves delay compensation and then switching to just doing all the input compensation, it instantly to me fixed it, you know, and then the solution that, you know, cause I use C6 on the, on the mains left to right. Um, uh, and a, on a, on another bus as well, I came up with a simple solution of just capturing that, um, just capturing the, the off my longest group, which happens to be the bass guitar. Um, and then and just so trying to line everything, line up everything close to it. So just so everybody understands there. So that C6 that we see, remember how we saw this trace when we were talking about stacking, multi-band and things like that, guys. I think this was last week, right? Well, that C6 is across his master bus here. So all inputs are going to go through that master bus when you're measuring them. And we can't bypass it. Remember, we can't get out of that trace. So what Jason has done here very cleverly, which is the right thing to do, and I, I want to bring this up because we're going to use this method on a few other things going forward, is he's just stored his longest path as the reference trace. And now we're going to start adjusting time and make everything else lay right on that 
trace as he's going through his master bus, and then we know they're in time, right? So you're just adjusting time there on what channel, Jason? That's a base DI that's literally right next to it. Because this is the, so just because, you know, I have time to kill. I literally did this, doing this on another artist file that uh, I'm going to go do coming up if yeah. we ever go back to work. When we go back to work. Right. Sorry. Cautiously optimistic. <laughs> um, so it gets close. You know, it's it's a really like, it's, you know, like I've zoomed in as far as I can on certain things to just, you know, because the C6, I like what it does, but man, trying to line things up to it is, is increasingly difficult. Is there any chance that active trace you have there has any kind of low frequency equalization on it somewhere? A high pass nope, filter? Nope, not at all. None? No. Wow, that's interesting. No. no, this has started from a raw file too. Like I, I've been building this file. Yeah. Um, so the only thing I copy over... Um, because I figured out how to save it is I have preset macros um, and I created the macro to, for the Digico to turn pink noise on and off uh, right. on every channel. You know, I, I would give you this to consider there. Um, if you're not doing any alignment past your master bus, right? Maybe yeah. like doing any other kind of alignment in the thing, then I would go in and actually take that C6 out of circuit because it's impacting every input on the console anyway, right? Yep. So I would take it out of circuit, completely out of circuit, get all the alignment in place, and then put it back in. And, and you'll, your throughput will increase, obviously, with it in, but it's the same impact on all the inputs. That way you could work from a flat face trace if you wanted to do it. Yeah, except for I bring in my lead vocal usually on the matrix side of it. Okay, that, that that's why work. I was asking. Yeah. That's why I was yeah. asking. So. Yeah. Yeah, that, that means you are doing alignment outside the master bus. So then, yeah, yeah then don't do that there. It'll throw you off oh. there. But All right, I, that's I'm, awesome. It works. That's awesome. I swear by it now. So yeah. I love it. I love it. It's nice to hear some positive feedback, let me tell you. Uh, that's great, Jason. And as you guys are seeing, that's not just an S6L up there. Okay, that's another console where this is having to happen. So uh, so great, man. I, I appreciate you coming in and sharing that. That's great. I look yeah, forward no to coming out and hearing it, man. Invite Absolutely. me to a show, will you? I mean, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> that will do. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, let's have one more guest, because I, I know he's in the room here somewhere, because I asked him to be here. Uh, Eric Chancy, are you in the room? I am present. Nice, nice. All right, so I asked Eric in, because Eric was one of the very first people um, that I actually I went out to his facility and did an alignment on his console. He was having, you know, just some issues. We couldn't figure out whether it was PA or band or mic positions or any of that stuff. But I noticed he was using a lot of outboard inserts because he was on a Soundcraft console and using uh, UAD stuff, uh, you know, in a lot of insert places. So I, I, you know, suggested, hey, let's do a time alignment on your console and see what kind of response we get. So this was some time ago now. Yeah. Tell me little, what's happening. Over yeah, tell me how you uh, how your life has been since then. Well, since then, you know, it's it's all been magical unicorns and <laughs> uh, people just coming up and telling me how awesome everything sounds. Yeah, but I mean, people besides you telling me oh, these oh, things. Oh. Okay. Well, let's let's just go back. It's been a little over a year. I think it was a year in February that you came out, and yeah. before then never even really considered you know the the uh the throughput of the plugins and like you were saying i was uh using a bunch still am using a bunch yeah but now they're all leaving the console at the same time right but the difference i found when we got everything timed up before you, you wouldn't notice before it sounded okay it was fine but the difference when we got everything timed up was like, the best way I can describe it is like, you're looking at a Polaroid from like 1980 to an ultra HD 4K, same image, yeah. but the resolution of that image is so much tighter and, and, and you know, everything's more vibrant. And it, it just all came together a lot nicer. Um, yeah, the, there the, were- The one, uh, uh, Thing I've heard people that I've done it for describe it, and I think it's a beautiful way of describing it, is like looking through a lens on a camera that has great depth of field now. 
you know, where yeah. everything is in focus, whether it's in the front of the picture or the back of the picture, everything feels in focus. You know, that was their, that yeah. was their perception of the result, you know. We could hear better details like on the effects that go through my UAD system. Um, there was just little, you know, a lot of little small things like that. And we've, mm -hmm. we've kind of talked about that before and you know, you kind of talked about it at the, uh, you, you kind of hit on it at the beginning there where people are telling you, well, it's not worth the time, you know, whatever. But we've talked about before, it's a million little things that make great sound. And then this is just one of those additional little things that you can do that just push your sound another step better. I know when we were there, I, I remember hearing what you were doing pre-alignment and actually thought it was pretty good. I, I mean, I thought, wow, this sounds pretty good. I wonder if we're going to get a lot of improvement if we do an alignment here. But then when we did the alignment, I mean, it was, at least to my ears, apparent, it was like immediately apparent there was an element of clarity to it now that yeah. was not there before, you know? Yeah. Clarity yeah, and that's, depth, you know? It, it's just like a fuzzy photograph versus a really, you know, in focus, nicely, you know, nice digital focused photograph you just yeah, so much yeah. more uh, uh, resolution and presence yeah. in the system than uh, before did you find and it easier to EQ things like drums and things like that when, when they oh, were all yeah. the time I mean, it, it's it's um sometimes I think it's not you know it's a, one or two DB steps you could really kind of hear the difference going on there and, and you know it I had to get other people and ask them, hey, can you hear this as well? Or is it just my head messing with me? I just tell them myself, right? Yeah, yeah. And they, you can actually hear little little steps like that. Um, and it's it's kind of crazy because you know, you, you're used to just kind of grabbing the knob and spinning it. And, you know, and now you have to be really careful because you can really hear those changes really well. Great. Well, I'm glad you're having success with it. I, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, you're good. You're a good testimonial yeah. for me here. Yeah. So I thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. All right, Eric, thank you very much for coming in, man. I appreciate you hanging out with us and uh, sharing your story there. That's cool. You're very welcome. Yeah. I'll see you down the road somewhere. Um, let's see, where do we go from here? Well, uh, today, I think the other thing we had was... Make sure I'm not missing anything on the agenda here. Right. So today, yeah. So today, uh, I think what I want to do today is uh, give you or kind of walk you through my uh, my uh, my process for you know getting this all into play very quickly. Uh, like you know, the last time or the first times we talked about it, I made the play of okay. Well, I, I use a pre-built template, you know, and of course. That our computer, our competition for S6L is taking that and saying, "Well, on S6L, you've got to pre-build a show file to be able to use it." It's like, no, you don't have to, but if you want to do this, this is a nice, easy way to do it. So I'm going to pull up my template today and give you a little tour of it, and then we're going to build a big set list off of it. And I'm going to kind of show you how easily this can be done, not just on S6L. You could probably do the same sort of thing on your console as well if it's not S6L, but how liberating this can be to just pre-build, come into a show. It's almost like a festival mentality. It's like, well, this, these are my kick drum channels that I use all the time. Plug into it, and I, we're going to be in a pretty good spot. You know, all of these things. So, it, yeah, terrible description of it, but this is what we'll do. So to do that, i got to actually load the show file here. So let me get that going. It's going to take a minute here. Oh. And I'm going to go back to share. Everybody see the big venue screen there? All right, great. I think I'll get a few more people in here. Here it comes. 
All right, so here's my template. I've just pulled it into this file so we can load it today. Uh, and we're going to uh, actually build a show file from this. All right, so the first thing I'll do is load it, which it is loading. And as with any kind of template like this that you're working with, I don't care whether it's in Microsoft Word or it's in your show file here, the first thing you want to do when you get ready to go to work is save a copy of it as the new show file. Don't fall into the trap of editing on your show file, or on your template, otherwise you're gonna to have to go back and rebuild your template later, right? So first thing I'm gonna do is, as you can see, it's loaded here. Uh, down in the lower right-hand corner, you can see this called uh, Scoville template. And I'm just gonna save a new one and call it Scoville template. Okay. All right. So that, that is now the show file that we are working on. Okay. Everybody with me? And we're going to start editing this. But first, I'm going to just going to take you on an overview of the template itself. All right. So what you can see in front of you right now is all input channels. Uh, and I'm going to get over on the other screen so I can actually annotate a little bit here. This is the first time I've ever shown this to somebody. So this is going to be interesting. All right, so I'm just going to outline what we have here. So in the first slots, one through 60 something there, this is all open inputs, all right? These are unused inputs, this, uh, all the way down through here. And the last, I've got a, a couple of them that are pre-built as stereo inputs in case I need them, they're here. These are all channels that I've already built and used in the past. These are all input channels, and I'll take you through these in just a minute. I just want to let you give you the input. This is what we're going to draw from to build our input list. The bottom row here is all parallel returns. This is all effects returns, uh, parallel guitar channels, parallel drum channels, all of those channels that we talked about last week of using subharmonic stuff, of using drum crush, of, of using vocal crush, vocal color, if I want to use a guitar pedal on an instrument, etc. All of that is already set up in those return paths, right? And the ability to just add inputs to those paths is done. It, all of this is already pre-aligned. I've, I've gone through with noise. All my plugins are already inserted here, uh, and I can just start building this as we need it. Uh, let me clear this out and go to the next place. All right, so if I then now go to, uh, oops, I get my, I'm so cursor challenged here. All right, so now if we go to plugin, the plugins rack per se, you can see that I have lots of plugins in play here, right? Uh, and I'll once again go over here to outline some of this. So here, Oops. <laughs> there we go. So for instance, this is in my systems rack. This is my master bus insert. You can see that I've got a parallel subharmonic in play. Uh, what do we got here? This is the stuff I've got inserted and ready for bass guitar. Uh, this is some uh, how I handle some guitar paths. Now notice I've got uh, an amp emulator in there, right, right here, uh, that is not in circuit. I, I haven't aligned for that, and usually uh, if I'm going to have to use that, I'll know it ahead of time and can then realign if I want to do it, but I've got it out of path right now. Uh, over here, this is all vocal work, so one of my, you know, primary change and keep in mind I was getting ready to do a big award show with this so I, you know I have paths that I kind of like for this this was this would be considered a lead vocal insert path which is a uh, big DSP dynamic EQ into an LA2A and then a DSer following it and previous to this in the signal path I would use the onboard compression for limiting so I would limit the vocal then EQ it then compress it then DS it all right that's the path on that over here is all parallel paths. This is all parallel returns for uh, reverbs, etc. So this is a pre-reverb EQ reverb. As you can see, it looks like it's uh, that's on a slap delay. Uh, this is on a spin delay, so a long delay, etc. As we move on down, 
you know, just all the plugins are in play here. So for instance, on my drums, you know, I always have this in play, whether I use it or not, I always have it available to me. Uh, let me here. Let me clean this. So notice right here, we'll use this kick drum as the example. This path is available to all of my actual drum channels. It's an, a preamp emulation followed by a tube equalization, a wide filter tube equalization like the Pultec, followed by tape compression, right? So that gives me the possibility of creating a much more analog sounding drum than just going through it pure digital. Would I use it everywhere? Absolutely not. But I have it available to me if I want and it's already pre-aligned, right? All I gotta do is put it in circuit. Notice all of those are out of circuit in my template. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to show you here? So, I mean, that's it in a nutshell. You, you kind of get the sense there that all of this is pre-built and ready to go. And, you know, I'll just say this about it. This is kind of the beauty of digital, right? This is the beauty of digital, is to be able to preset these things and get them ready so that you don't have to go out and build this every show from the ground up, right? That's crazy to do that in digital. I, I mean, I'm not sure what we're trying to achieve or what we're trying to serve there. I, are we trying to serve some sort of creativity there or something where we say, I don't want to just repeat everything I'm doing on every mix. Well, there's, <laughs> I, I hate to break the news to you, but there are recording studios that have been doing that for 50 years. You know, this is the bass path we use here. This is the guitar path we use here. You want to change it, you can, but this is where we start. You know, that I means that's been in play forever. All right. So let's, uh, let's see, what do we want to talk about here now? So, here. So in the patch bay right now, there is obviously nothing patched in. Uh, if we go up through the stage racks here, nothing patched into stage one, stage two. I've only got one stage rack actually on this system right now, but they're all available to you here. So what we're going to do is move channels into place based on an input list and then patch in a preamp on it. Now I'm going to let this cat out of the bag early. Uh, and it has to do with how S6L uh, handles preamp when you move a channel in and patch it into a different stage rack input. Uh, S6L uh, venue in total does not store preamp information with the channel, right? So you're going to have to reset your preamp every time you do this. But I, I'm just going to speak for me here. I could care less. I know I'm going to need to set the preamp regardless of whether it's on a setting that I've previously used or not. I'm going to need to reset it for the new gig. So I don't care about preamp. I know when I line check, I'm going to set it and have a pretty good shot. But once I do that, all of my path is already in place. It's already patched, already routed. And if you use a consistent method for setting your preamp gain, you're going to get a very consistent result as you set it going forward. Right? Use the same approach to setting preamp every time. Okay, so again, none of that's patched yet. We're going to do that in a few minutes here. this. All right, so I guess the next thing we would discuss, let's see, yeah. Worth also noting this, that all of my events that I've built over time are all in this template, right? I have a jillion types of events here that are for me to use uh, that are great. And that, you know, I certainly don't want to get into a situation where I'm building events all the time. I'll give you an example of one event here, which is the way I handle uh, rhythm guitar and solo. So let's go to our parallel path here. Uh, do this for guitar two. So one of the things I do with events is use a solo channel to turn down rhythm channels. So if you watch, let me get back over here. I need more cursors. Watch this area right here. This is one of the pre-built paths that I have to do this. So, um, and maybe maybe what we should do is this as well. Okay. 
Okay, so on the console, you can see that I have some inputs up here, which is what we're going to discuss next. But in terms of pre-building events, I've already got this mechanism in place where if I turn up my solo channel, which is my VCA here, it automatically turns down the rhythm channels. Like I have that whole mechanism all pre-built and ready to go. All I've got to do is turn or, or patch the right guitars into that channels, into those channels, and that is pre-built and ready to go. I don't have to sit and figure out how to build that on a show day, right? So all of these mechanisms for these paths are already pre-built in. All I've got to do ultimately is get the right inputs coming into the right channels, set the gains, and we're pretty close to go. We're at a place where we could definitely make some music pretty quickly, okay? All right, so on that note, uh, I'm going to show you this part next, uh, which is an, a very important piece of this. Uh, and that is, uh, certainly on SXL, this is a huge luxury to be able to do this, where I set up uh, each of my families of instruments. For, in the situation I'm going to show you here is the drums. I set up their entire signal path in front of me in a layout. Okay, so on SXL, you have 48 layouts available to you on board that you can access at any time. And these are, for me, these are pre-built layouts. I carry these with me to every show. So if you look in the overhead here, I'm going to blow this up a little so you can see it. Oops. So uh, this is layout for the drums. Now remember, we haven't built the input list or anything like this, but the, the, uh, the layout is done. So these are all my pre-built drum channels. Kicks, snares, hi-hat, all the toms two overhead choices, one a split overhead, one an XY overhead that are used for different things. These are the auxiliary masters that are used for the drums. There's my drum drive, there's my drum room, or my drum plate. All of those aux masters are sitting there. This is my goo drive. Remember last week we talked about a goo channel. This is an auxiliary master that drives goo. These are return paths. This is my KST, which is kick, snare, and toms that goes out to the master bus. This is my crush path. Uh, for the drums. This is the goo return. This is the actual room and plate return. So I have those available to me. This is the drum subgroup master. This is the pro sub. This is my subharmonic return. This is the master left right fader. And then over here that you can't see behind the camera, I have my pink noise and my measure and reference for smart. Right? All of that sitting right in front of me here. So what that allows me to do uh, in setup is this. Let me uh, get this on here. I'm going to turn some noise on. Oh, and that should be off, by the way. Uh, I already did this not long ago. I need to put this back. Okay, so now I got noise going into my reference. Now let's go. I'm just going to patch pink noise into. Let's just take it into the snare drum for a second, just because we can. Because I want to show you that you've got this entire path in front of you, and how handy this is. Because you're going to take advantage of this when you're get, when you're line checking as well. Before you've ever built an in, a, a layout that's going to be used in the show, you're going to take advantage of these layouts uh, for line check, etc., in order to be be able to get through them very quickly. So let me go here and patch the snare drum. All right. So on the console, you can see the noise coming into my snare top channel, right? So watch what happens when I turn this on. Let's see if I can get on here. So notice the entire console comes to life, right? So now I can see the level that is hitting the aux buses. I can see the level that is into my uh, parallel paths. Uh, looks like I've got the goo channel turned off for a second. So I'm going to go up and turn that on. Where are you, goo drive? There you are. So now we've got the goo return as well. We've got the plate. And the room return, this is our group master. That's the pro sub. You can see what information is going to the pro sub. And now you can also see the left right master when that group is put into play, All right, which would be this guy, assigned to left right, 
Why am I not seeing you? I think it's because of this. So now you can see the level at the left, right master. So what this allows you to do is when you're line checking the drums, right, you have the best possibility of getting your gain structure absolutely right because you can see the entire path all the way to the left, right master. Every inch of it you can see. Aux masters, returns, effects returns, etc. And then on top of it, when you start putting actual drums in this, you can just, as soon as he starts hitting the snare drum, I'm up and I'm on gain guess immediately. Give me a good guess of what that gain should be and it should come out just exactly right here because I've used this in the past. I know if that input gain is right, this sound or this gain structure is going to be probably really close to being right. Okay? Hang on, I got to let a couple more people in here. Chew on that for a second and let me know what you think of that. All right, so I'm going to stop there and take a couple of questions here. So it uh, looks like Christopher Dean, you're the first up. You got a question there? Yes, sir. Does your template account for the three different engine sizes in the unified uh, platform? Uh, it does not. Uh, if I know I'm going to be on a different engine size, uh, that would affect – let me just get, show you what will affect by that. That will affect this. Right, because not all uh, engines have the same amount of channels available to you, processing channels, right? So if I know I'm going to move to a smaller engine and I'm going to need to load this template, I'm going to have to get up here and adjust it. For instance, if I knew I was going to be in a 112 engine, right, then I would take all of these channels and drag them up and get it inside of 112. Does that answer your question there? Yes, sir. Because okay. as, soon as, as soon as I bring it in and load it on the 112 engine, it would lop off the, everything past 112, right? So I've got to do it either in a show file or in standalone and get it there. Now, one of the beautiful things that we've done, I, I've got to really applaud the guys at Avid for doing this because it is going to save... <laughs> For, for people that use a fair amount of plugins, it's going to save our lives. Because one of the challenges we used to have with this is when you went from engine size to engine size, it changed the number of plug-in slots, right? That has now changed. All engines have the same amount of plug-in slots. And I think it's going to be 400 now. All engines have the same amount of plug-in slots. So uh, with that in mind, you know, if you go over here, remember, you know, how many slots have I got here? You know, that's 200 slots there. Well, if I moved to a 112 engine previously, I think that's only 100 slots, maybe even 80. I would then have to move all of these plugins up to the top half of the rack. I might even have to sacrifice some. That's all gone now. I think with 6.3, if I remember right, uh, boy, I hope I'm right here. I hope I'm not getting in trouble. Uh, I think it's all consoles are going to have the same amount of plugin slots. So I'm very excited about that. That's really going to help us template users for sure. Does that make sense? Sully, you got uh, a comment, question there? Mike's muted, Sully, if you don't know. It's not unmuting. There you are. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't unmuting with my space bar. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, did you say that competitors were using it against Avid because you said that you should use a template or that you are using a template? Yeah. Yeah. They were saying it's funny because that's how you get the best results, really, by setting this stuff up in advance. I know it was interesting. It was it was the concept of well, with our console, you don't have to do any of this pre-alignment stuff, et cetera. You know, I mean, it, it was, I mean, I get it. You know, I mean, everybody's trying to make money and and sell their products, so I get it. But it was I just thought it was kind of funny. It was like, wow, really, we're going to go after template use here too, huh? Okay, all right. Well, it, it's it's really bizarre because if you think about it, like. I mean, just, just the basic use of templates of like setting all your filters of your EQ where you like them or, yeah. you know, thresholds and ratios where you think you might need them. Like just the basics of a template is, you know, very important, I think, for most people, let totally. alone advanced totally. users. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll just, I mean, I'll speak of my own experience. Once you get used to using one and can do it, I mean, you just, 
it's mind blowing how fast you can get a show file put together and have it be pretty dang good the minute it comes online, you know. Where it's like, wow, I you know, just the amount of work I don't have to do right now is kind of startling, you know, to get it get it to work. It's like you get paid and off for all the previous work. Slots. Say that again, I, I cut you off. And right? you were correct about the four hundred slots. Everything will have the same now. Yeah, good. I just wanted to make sure I didn't predate that a little bit. Let, you know, let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. Uh, okay, let's, uh, so let's get down to this. I, I really don't want to make this a really long lab today. We, we probably all need a little bit of a break from these things. Uh, okay, so uh, I don't know if I can actually pull this up on screen. Maybe I can. Here, hang on one second. Let me see if I can get this up on screen. And Robert, before we finish today, I was wondering if you could uh, quickly describe the actual routing of like your vocal parallel pass and the, and the dummy channel for the time alignment stuff. Cause I've had a few people ask me about uh, the routing of that because the, the document that you give out with the, the lab uh, doesn't, isn't super descriptive. So I was wondering if you could just touch sure. on that before the end of this. Yeah, of course. Okay. So if I go here, yeah, there we go. All right. So this is the uh, show file we're going to build today. And I picked this one specifically because it's got some uh, some odd things about it. All right, so here's what we got. This is a big orchestra gig. Uh, this is a big show I did last year. Uh, but you'll notice that it, you know, it patches in a very uh, uncommon way. So there's a number of stage racks on this. I think in total we probably had four, four or five. No, I'm not sure now. Now that I think about it. At any rate, uh, as you can see, the first stage rack here. is the orchestra, right? It's a lot of violin mics uh, right on down through a bunch of vocal RFs. There's all kinds of weird stuff in this, right? And then we get to the kit. So the drum kit doesn't start till uh, channel one of the second stage rack. Now the other piece of this that's interesting for our world is uh, it's working in uh, uh, sets of 56 channels, not 64, right? So we actually, in our situation, we're not actually going to use eight inputs of one of the stage racks here. But I, I don't want to get too far down in the weeds to that. I, I want to show you how to take the template and quickly do this. Okay, so uh, let's start getting this in order here. Shut this back down here. I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it in little resolution there and just kind of walk you through what I'm doing here. And I want to kind of reiterate, I had this, I had done other orchestra stuff already with this that was close mic orchestra. So I had some of these channels already kind of pre-built and ready to go. And the thing you want to pick up on here is that when I move a channel into position in terms of where it's going to be patched into the, from the snake, and then I copy and paste that channel, everything copies and pastes with that channel with the exception of the preamp game, right? Like all of its routing, if it's got VCA assignments, all of that is going to come with it when we patch this. All right, so let's go do this here. Let's go do our first one. Otherwise, we'll be here till tonight. All right, so I'm going to go back to the overview for a second. Don't worry about that noise. So our first channel in our setup is a violin, right? So I'm going to go down here and find my violin channel from my template. And it is right here. Uh, let's see if I can actually select it. So that's my first violin. So if you notice, that is called Violin Close Mic. That is a channel that I've already got built for it. All right. So I'm going to go back to inputs here. And you can see that channel is selected. You can see the equalization that's on it. Uh, it's turned up in a bus. It, all kinds of things are already done to it. There are no plugins on it. Right. So that needs to be in channel one. So we're going to take that and we are going to move it to channel one or position one. All right. Okay. So that is in position one right now, meaning I, and I'm going to patch it into channel one of the snake. Uh, Gianluca, I'll get to you in just a minute if you can hang in there. So the next question is, well, okay, now what? I've got six, eight channels of first violin. Uh, do I, do I just patch it to those eight? Maybe I do it. For the second violin as well, I mean, there can't be much difference in first violin and second violin, probably to start with. So what I need is 
13 more of them, right? 13 more of these violins. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to multi-select. Oh, actually, I'm going to copy first. Sorry. We're going to go here and right-click and copy violin, all right? And then we're going to put it in a bunch of other channels here. So I've got to get all the way to channel 14, was it? Yeah, so 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And there I'm going to say paste to selected strips. Boom. There they all are. Now, I'm also going to make these all the same color. I definitely want to do this. So I'm going to go to my amber here. Now, there's all of my violin channels. You with me? Okay. How about uh, what's our next thing? It's uh, viola. All right. I'm going to go back to my channels, find the viola. Voila. There it is. Back to the patch. Let me select this strip here. There's my viola now. How many violas do I need? One, two, three, four, five, six violas. Copy. Paste. There's all of my violas. Make them all the same color. At least for me, I always make these all the same color. All right, so now I've got violins and viola. And we just keep on going, right? Let's find out where my drum kit's going to be. Well, let me stop there to just say, once we get this all done, right, where we put this, these in order, understand that what I've got done here is the snake patch. This is my inputs layout. I want this in the same order that my patch is going to be. And here's why. Once it's done, I can go to the patch bay then, and I can go up here to the stage racks and select all of them so I can see the entire grid. Go here, and so I can actually even, I can use this, uh, the, the auto patcher if I want to do it, but I can also drag here and just patch the entire thing, right? Now, the next piece of the puzzle that has to take place here is naming. Obviously, I didn't, or, or we don't copy and paste name here, so this becomes violin. Oops, I can type. My dog bit me the other day and I can't type. Tab, violin. You know, we can make these whatever you want. You just got to go right on down and label them. Okay. Damn dog. What did right. you do to that dog to make him bite you? You know, I feed him every damn day and still he bites me. Still he bites me. <laughs> but you kind of get the concept here, right? Now, Here's where we kind of break with what we used to do in Venue, right? It used to be in Venue, you would get your inputs patched, and then you would drag and drop channels all over the place to lay them out how you wanted them laid out. Honestly, I'm just going to, this just a suggestion. You can always do whatever you want. I'm going to suggest that you don't do that here because it allows you to always keep your patch one for one. You're never, if you don't do that, you're never going to get confused on what channel is patched into what channel of the snake. Because I could go to inputs right now on the overhead of the console. And I know right now that fader one is patched in from snake channel one. I know that fader 17 is patched in from snake channel 17. I know that channel 24 is going to be patched in from snake channel 24. Right? It's one for one with my patch. And on top of that, if you build a show, uh, um, a recording session in Pro Tools based on this show file, it will also be patched one for one. And you can very easily get out of a left-right patch in Pro Tools versus a one for one for your recording. You don't have all this mixed input settings, right? Because remember, if you, if you drag and drop this now and then build your Pro Tools session, it's not going to be one for one. It's not going to be channel one is channel is input one, etc. It's going to be as your layout. So I advise, especially as powerful as layouts are on the console, I advise everybody to keep this one for one. It'll make it where you can very easily know what is patched where, right? And you can get in and out of it. Because remember, one of the other things you might want to do is patch noise into these channels if you want to check your reference. 
And that way, you know, I, I know beyond a shadow of doubt if I'm doing that on input, if I patch noise into channel four, well, if I want to get out of the noise and get back on the mic pre now, I know it's stage rack one input four because it's fader number four on my input layer. Everybody follow me there? I'm going to give you a second just to chew on that, and I'm going to answer a question here. Uh, Gianluca, go ahead. I'm sorry if you got to backtrack on your question, but it's okay. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, no problem, Rob. Thanks. Um, as far as templates, do you typically, because they usually work off templates either in Pro Tools or, yeah. or Live, um, do you typically keep your inserts and all your plugins bypassed? And add accordingly, or how does what's your workflow on that? Yeah, all those plugins are bypassed until I hear the input, right? Now it can affect gain structure, but that's why, you know, it's almost like you're kind of uh, I don't want to say it. You're kind of making your best guess on it at, at input the first time you hear the input. You're going to gain guess that anyway, and then it's a matter of well, if I add plugins and it changes gain structure downstream, I you know I might have to deal with that. Uh, so yeah, the, the plugins in bypass can impact your gain structure a little bit and you might have to adjust for it, but you're going to decide pretty early on when you hear that thing, it's like, Oh, you know, I need this on it. Yeah. It's yeah. That's better with it on it. I mean, you're going to try it right out of the gate, but I always start in bypass without question. Always start in bypass. Yeah. I think, you, I think you have a better chance of, you know, not falsely putting something on it that doesn't need it. If you do that, right. If you start processed, it feels backwards to me there. But to each his own, of course. Cool. Thanks. Good question. All right. So we've kind of got the idea of using our inputs now. Once you're done there, you know, you're going to want to at some point kind of build your first show layout and get that going as well. And, and like I said, you know, in layouts, we have all kinds of layouts that we can look at here. So if you look at this section of my console here, I won't zoom in on it. I'll just explain it to you. Obviously, I have my entire drum path that we can see here. Uh, well, here's my entire percussion path. I can see exactly the same thing here. It's a complete path, uh, including my pink noise and my FFT drive. All of it's there. I don't have to go looking for it anywhere. Same thing for bass guitar. Here's all the bass guitar options plus its FFT path. All of this is pre-built and ready to go. I can see all of Guitar 1's paths, all of Guitar 2 path, the lead vocal path, the backing vocal path, Right. And, you know, you can make versions of this that you can use for the show. Obviously, during the show, I may not need to see the entire path. But then at that point, I just take this layout, copy it to another layout and make it a show layout. So then if I'm navigating during the show, usually during the show, I have VCAs, my main mixing VCAs here, my audio subgroups here, and then I'll fill in inputs around that that I might need. So to navigate, I'm doing one of two things. I'm either spilling to get to the inputs inside a group, spilling to get to the inside uh, or to the inputs that are under the control of the VCA, or I'm just using one of these layouts to get to guitar two, backing vocals, keyboards, whatever it's going to be, right? I don't have to decollate my input faders, right? These all stay one for one just so I can easily navigate it in, in case there's a problem, right? Is that making sense to everybody? After that, in terms of processing, you know, then you're just going to go to, um, you know, I, I, you could take advantage of the, uh, the folders then, right? So if I'm on inputs, uh, let me go here, I'll find something down here. Let me do it this way, it's faster. So if I was in a uh, you know, drum room or whatever, I might have tons. I don't have it in this particular console right now. I haven't moved them over. Uh, but maybe in this reverb, you know, I, I'll usually have three or four different presets of reverb that I just use, knowing what sound I've got there. Maybe i got a short, medium, long, extra long, pre-built and ready to go. I can just load that at the drop of a hat, right? I don't have to go searching for anything. It's all kind of pre-built into the reverb sound that I want to use. If the moment dictates that I need to use something else, maybe I need to move from a room to a hall or a hall to a chamber, then that's a decision you're going to make on site, right? But it doesn't change any of the routing and the assignment. All of that's already done. Yeah. Is that making sense to you guys? I mean, we could go through this. I, I won't do it because we're already 
uh, hour and a half into it here, but I, I would say to you, I mean, this is a, let's have, take a look at how many inputs are in our play. Yeah, I mean, this is three full stage racks of stuff. Right? This is close, this is, well, I, I know for a fact, with all the effects returns on it, this was right at 192 inputs. And I could build this show file and get it ready to go 20 minutes, maybe less. 15 minutes? It's all Imagine dangerous. without a template. Without a template, that would take, this is no exaggeration, without a template, that would take hours to build. That would take a couple of hours to build. Easy. And you wouldn't be as in, good, in as good a spot when you showed up at the event because nothing's tried and tested under fire. You got to remember this drum path, these bass paths, all of this effects processing, compression, it's all been tested under fire. You know, you know it works. It's just a matter of plugging the correct inputs into the channels and turning them on. Right? So I encourage you to think about, and I will put it in the context of these labs, especially if you're trying to do time alignment, right? Where you want to align your console and ensure that it's right. Then it, to some degree, demands that you work from a template. You know, I don't, I, trust me, I don't want to be on a show day worrying about time alignment in no way, shape or form. I do. I want to be doing that. There's a ton of things I don't want to worry about doing you know, on the show day. I want to get down to mixing as soon as possible, you know, especially on these big award shows. I mean, you, you may only get one pass, two passes at the song. You know, you're lucky to get two full passes except for the the main headliner, you know, so you got to be able to work quickly. So in terms of layouts then, you know, notice in my snapshots, I have no layout or no snapshots built yet, but I have one called base layout and it is only to do with my layouts, right? And I haven't stored it yet here. But, you know, once I, like, once I understand what I'm going to use in terms of groups, because there may be groups that I don't use, there may be inputs that I don't use, et cetera. Once I get all that done, I'll make what I, I consider the basic layout that I'm going to use in all snapshots and then just augment inputs into it as I need them. Gianluca, you got another question there, man? Yeah, sorry, I know we're ending, we're getting close. No, you're uh, fine, you're fine, buddy. Uh, as far as, so, if, you know, you have your snare sound. Yeah. Um, and then after a while, you realize that you wanted to change a plug in here, or even yeah. on your master bus. Um, you've already aligned. If you need to change, do you have to realign? And maybe this question's been asked already, but I might have missed it somewhere. Uh, what's, is it basically, just so I get the concept, You've aligned, you've got all your sounds, you've got all your channels, everything's ready to go. Again, you change something, do you have to realign the entire console? What's, no. what's the vibe? No, you don't. And we actually talked about this a little bit, and I, I'm not trying to bag on you there, but it, it, it's actually just simple math. So if we go to, um, uh, let's go to the snare drum, because it's the best example to use for this. So my snare drum was my longest path, and this would typically be the worst case scenario if you were going to change a plug in here, because now you've changed your reference, right? Now, keep in mind, we've already aligned. So if we change the snare drum time here, the only channel that is exiting the console at a different time is the snare drum right now. So you're still going to stay pretty good, even if you had to fudge it at last minute and kind of go, ah, i got to change this. Go for it. It's not going to be a, a, a catastrophe. But uh, remember, in the early one, uh, early part of this, I talked about if you, you know if this is your reference channel, if this is creating your reference time, actually add some buffer to it to allow you to change things, right? So here, if you remember, well, that was actually what my next thing was about the the buffering. Yeah. So notice this was my longest path, but I went ahead and added twenty samples to it. Okay. So the idea here is that as long as I keep the same net time on this channel, then nothing will change input to output in terms of throughput. Right. So, for instance, if I go down, let, maybe let's just do it here. I'll, I'll give it. A, I'll, I'll fly without a net here. Stand by. So let's say I'm going to go here, and I'm going to change this Paltech. I'm going to go to a different style of EQ than this Paltech that is on there. Well, I want to go here first and look, and I want to see how many samples that is. That is seven samples for the Paltech. You see that there? Yeah. Okay. So if I want to change this EQ. To let's make it. I'm just going to do something easy here. Let's go to let's go to parametric instead. 
Oh, of course, it's the same time. <laughs> of course it is. Let me pick another one here. Let's pick something a little more. All the avid ones are going to be short like that. Right, right. Let's go. Well, uh, I've already got that on there. Let's try this. There we go. That one's 31 samples, right? So this little pedal is 31 samples. So what's the difference in that? It's, it's 20, what is it? Let me do the math here. 24 samples longer, right? So I've got, and actually this wouldn't work because it's outside of my buffer range there. So I've got to, I've got to take and recreate that channel. Let's see, I've got to, I would have to take off, oh, does that work? What is that net? Yeah, that's net 24, so this wouldn't work. I would have to take this time completely off, and then I would be off by four samples compared to the rest of the channels. You, you can add four to everything. Yeah, I would have to add four to everything at that point. Gotcha. Which I probably, under fire, I probably wouldn't do, honestly. I would, I would just let that wash. Like I said, that's the only channel that's leaving four samples late now. I would, you know, you got, at some point, you got to use some common sense on it and let things go. If I was in building stage, would I go do that? Yeah, I would probably go out. If I had the time, yeah, I would go reset that. You know. But do you get the concept there uh, of just keeping your net time the same on every channel? Yeah, I guess my, I guess the question leaded more to, and you answered it. I appreciate it. Um, leaded more to, I guess, the workflow of once you have everything, if you wanted to change it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then kind of how to reshape your head. No, I, I honestly think once you have it all aligned, it actually makes that process very easy, although we ran into a, a roadblock here. You know, I mean, maybe it's telling me I need to make that 30 samples of buffer. You know, if it was 30 samples, then I would just change that number to six and then we would have the same throughput on that channel, right? But yeah, once it's all aligned, then you can still add plugins to your heart's content as long as you're making each channel the same net time, right? And, and simple math at that point, you don't have to worry about dropping samples or any of that stuff. You're actually just worried about this time, right? Adding, subtracting those times to make the net time on the channel the same, okay? Great, thank you. That'll take you, honestly, that'll take you a lot less time then showing up at a show file with an empty plugin rack and just building as you need it. I mean, I, you know, I, I marvel at that concept that people think that's one of the assets of digital. We would have never done that in analog. Can you imagine showing up at a gig analog with your console and a rack sitting there with nothing patched in or nothing able to be patched in? I, I, nobody would do that. I mean, and this whole concept of template really is kind of like working in festival mode. I mean, you really are working with a festival mindset here. These are the, these are the drum channels. Plug your drums into this regardless of what act you are, you know, if you're all working on one, one console. Yeah, I don't understand I mean, the argument, but I appreciate it. I mean, who wouldn't do that, right, at a festival? If you walked up at a festival where everybody is using the same console, would you say, I don't want my drum channels plugged in there, plug them in down here? Well, you've got 12 minutes for set change, okay? No line check. Which, which do you want to do? <laughs> All, right. All right. We're two minutes past our time and my target time today, so we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, we can continue on this a little bit next week if you want me to continue this build and show it out, but you really don't have to do much else there. You know, actually, there's one other thing I want to show you before we do that. So... Um, let's see if I can get this up here. Yeah. So on the right hand side of the screen there, you see my universe view. So the other thing that works really cool with this, uh, is remember, we're going to keep all, let me go here just to show it. This is another, uh, discussion point for, uh, where you place your channels. So remember now, by the time we get done with this process, all of these channels will be used up in order with actual mic inputs, right? But all of my parallel processing is going to stay down here. I'm going to leave it down here. I don't want to move it up. And there's reason for that because I always want to know where it is. I'm not going to move my drum processing up near my drum channels. I'm going to do that in layouts, not in input. Right? I want to keep this as tidy and as uninterrupted as I possibly can because it also plays into navigating the universe view over here, right? So in universe right now, you're seeing the first 69 channels there. Well, if I think, okay, well, I need to go get to my, my drum reverb. How do I get to it? With it set up this way, I know immediately all I got to do is scroll to the bottom 
and go to the green channel and it's right there. I can get to it immediately. I don't have to bank anywhere. Whereas if I spaced that out, if I moved it, if I drag and dropped it in the input layers there, then I would have to kind of go, where is that drum reverb? Right? Right now I know all parallel processing is down here. How do I get to my vocal reverb? It's right there. How do I get to my guitars? It's right there. You follow me there? So it's, it's navigational speed as well. So keeping your input stage all, input faders all in one for one, and then building layouts, man, that is the answer. I'm telling you, it's so good. Once you, once you are on a console that has customized layouts, and you have to go back to a console that does not have customized layouts, it is like working with handcuffs on both your feet and your hands. It is so tough. So tough. I don't know. I, I look back on, you know, when we were first in venue with those days and think, how did we do this without layouts? <laughs> I just, I, I marvel at it now, you know. And we did. We, we got away with it. But how did we do it? All right. I'm going to leave it open there for one or two more questions if you have it. And then we will knock it on the head here. And I will see you guys later in the week. Have other webinars later in the week if you guys are up for it. I think me and me and Sully are going to be on one on Wednesday with uh, Rob Allen and Jim Warren and oh, who else is going to be on there? Chris and I have no idea what we're going to talk about. But I'm sure it's going to be interesting. Any other questions, fellas? Let's see what else was I going to give you here? Oh, I know what I was going to give you here. Um, was, uh, you know what? I'll put it up in the Dropbox. So. Uh, after this session, up in the Dropbox, I'll put uh, the five things Robert did not say. You'll have that document in case you need to help anybody through this. <laughs> and then uh, I'll put up the link to the Midas video, which is on Facebook. And I, again, I encourage you to do that. Jim did a really good job with that. And look at their delay compensation options, because they actually have a lot of options in that console that's, that's done. But uh, I think one thing you'll note is there's no compensation option for external plugins there. So... We're all in the kind of the same boat there. Now, I, I'll let the cat out of the bag and say we are working on a solution for that at Avid. I, I think we should come up with the solution, and uh, I feel confident we will. So uh, just stand by. But in the meantime, manually delay compensate. Your show will sound great. I'm sure of it. All right, guys. Uh, that is it for me on Monday. You guys have a great week. I hope everybody's staying safe and staying healthy out there. And we will see you. Are we in next Monday? We are in next Monday. One more lab next Monday. And I uh, hope to see you guys in some of these other webinars. We'll see you around. Thanks for tuning in today. Thank you. Thanks. Exceptional as always.